like yesterday, we are going to have uh, a hands-on exercise today as well. So uh, please have your laptop ready, and uh, uh, we'll give instructions on that uh, at the end of the, the lecture part of this. Okay, so uh, what are we talking about today? So we'll set up the problem of learning neurosymbolic programs uh, a little bit more formally. And then uh, we are going to talk about DSLs because that, um, if you remember, was this um, important new kind of input to the learning problem here, as opposed to uh, just uh, classical deep learning. And so we'll talk about you know uh, how to define DSLs. Now, of course, uh, yesterday you already did some work on this uh, yourself, so uh, so you already uh, know a lot about that. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, and then we'll talk about uh, synthesis using. Enumerative search, which is the most basic kind of synthesis uh, neurosymbolic learning algorithm that you can think of. And then uh, we are going to talk about uh, this strategy called synthesis with neural relaxations. And uh, then uh, in the hands on part, we're going to experiment with um, the enumerative search based uh, synthesis. So just to give a, uh, just to flash this picture again. Uh, so this is the overall uh, story of neurosymbolic learning. Uh, you have uh, these uh, three inputs. You have the data. You have a DSL specification, and uh, you also have, uh, in many cases, some additional constraints. And then what you're getting out of this is this neurosymbolic model. We are going to think of this as a combination of two things. There is the alpha, which is the structure of this program, and um, as Armando mentioned earlier, one of the big wins potentially in, in neurosymbolic learning is that you have this very flexible space of uh, structures. Uh, but that's also a challenge because then you have to actually explore the space of those structures. And then theta are the parameters of the programs. And these could be, for instance, parameters of neural modules that appear inside your programs. OK, so then uh, what's the learning problem here? Um, again. Remember, alpha is the structure and theta are the parameters. So what we could do is that we could set up this um, bilateral optimization problem uh, where um, you are trying to um, minimize the loss function. And this loss function depends both on alpha and the theta. But um, on top of that, you don't want extremely complex program structures. And uh, so there is a penalty for, uh, for uh, complexity. And that is captured by this. Um, S function. So S of alpha is the structural cost for, for uh, an, uh, a program structure. And then you have the parameters, right? So, so now what you're doing is that you are um, optimizing over both alpha and theta, and uh, this is what the objective looks like. So what's the learning strategy? This is um, a picture. Um, so you would have, uh, again, these inputs, the DSL specification and the learning objective, the loss function. And we are going to not include the additional constraints at this point. That's something we'll briefly talk about in uh, tomorrow's lecture. And then um, what's going on is that you are getting uh, uh, feeding these inputs into the learning algorithm, and then you're getting this neural symbolic program as the output. Right. And as mentioned in the last uh, uh, session, uh, if we set this alpha as a neural network, then you get standard deep learning, and then you know finding alpha is of the generalization of uh, neural architectures. Okay, so now uh, we could uh, just take the optimization problem that we have, and we see that there is you know alpha and alpha loop and theta and data loop, and so we could you know uh, break it up, break the picture up like this. So we have you know first this objective of you know synthesizing a, a structure, and then for each structure we go and learn the optimal parameters uh, using gradients. And then the structure synthesis is a discrete optimization problem. And so we'll have to do something more potentially than, than just classical gradient descent on that. And then uh, you're getting this neuro symbolic program out of this. So um, how do we make the these boxes one and two efficient? This is really the big question algorithmically speaking in this area. And uh, so for um, for two, which is parameter learning to be effective, it's really helpful if this alpha is differentiated, right? If the program is differentiated. And so we're going to explore uh, a 
two uh, of these algorithms to it where you're making that assumption that alpha is differentiable. What if it's not? Well, then you can uh, try to construct differentiable approximations in a variety of ways. You actually uh, played with that uh, this idea a little bit in, in uh, yesterday's hands-on session. But there are also other strategies, right? There are all sorts of strategies known to uh, propagate gradients through uh, functions that are not necessarily differentiable, and we can we can imagine using those. And so, for one to be effective, we need to have some kind of a guidance, ideally. Uh, for the search, if you're just you know enumerating, you're going to get to some distance, but uh, you know uh, the space of structures is very massive even for relatively simple DSLs. So you really want some kind of additional guidance. And so, what does that guidance do? And um, there are a few general themes uh, that are emerging in this uh, area, and um, the simplest. Kind of algorithm is just you know you enumerate a whole bunch of structures and then you you train uh, those resulting structures. But uh, this enumeration process you could, as we'll see, uh, guide using ideas from programming languages and problem patterns. Uh, so that's uh, one category. And then we'll talk about neural relaxations today, where you are uh, training a neural network uh, inside the synthesis process at uh, at every step, and then you're using the result to guide the search process, and, and then we'll hear about that. Learning to synthesize this is something you already saw a little bit in Armando's talk, um, and uh, we'll also talk about it a little bit more in tomorrow's session. Lift and distill is this approach that um, also came up in Armando's talk. So he, he talked about program extraction, and so that's the idea over there that you are maintaining these two categories of. Um, of uh, representations, so you have neural representations and you have symbolic representations, and you're going back and forth between that. So you are lifting these symbolic functions into the neural space, and you're distilling the symbolic, the neural uh, functions uh, back into the symbolic space. Uh, so, um, so that's we'll also talk about that tomorrow a little bit, and then finally we'll talk about library learning, uh, specifically Dreamcore, which has already been mentioned several times in this uh, conversation. Okay, so uh, to start with the very basics, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about the DSLs that we are going to use over here. And uh, there are a lot of advantages to sticking with functional abstractions in the context of program synthesis. This has been established uh, in the classical program synthesis world, uh, and we are also seeing that in this uh, setting of neuro symbolic program synthesis. Uh, so, just uh, to give a few examples of operators that you might consider. Uh, so, you know, here is a map function. So, it's the, the classic map. You know, you're taking in a, a data structure and you're applying a function f to every element of it. So, here we'll just assume that it's a list and you're applying f to every uh, element of that list. Fold is an aggregator uh, where you are uh, going from one end and then you are you are aggregating the, the values using some function f and um, some initial value start. And I'm not going to go into the detailed definitions of this uh, uh, because I assume that uh, everybody here is mostly familiar with, with these operators. Um, so then, you know, unfold is the dual of fold. So whereas in fold you are aggregating, right? You're starting with a list and then you're aggregating it into a, a value. For example, you're you know, summing up all of the elements of the list. So in unfold, you are starting with an initial value, and you're repeatedly applying this step to essentially generate uh, a list. So let's just think about these three operators, right? And then let's think about a little DSL that uh, we could build out of this. So um, what are the primitives? So this is again the grammar notation that we introduced in the, the last session. So E is an expression. And an expression is recursively defined. An expression could be an input variable x. It could be a constant c. It could be um, a neural module, which is uh, characterized by theta, applying applied to these arguments d1 to be k, which can then self be expressions. Uh, you could also have algebraic operations, um, which are you know like addition and, and so on. If you and then you have math and fold and so on, right? And, uh, and uh, so you have a list data type here as well, in addition to the basic uh, data. 
So then, you know, what sort of thing can you do with this? Yes. Why is this uh, interesting to us? Well, uh, I'll get to that in a second, but before that, one thing to note is that everything here is differentiable by construction. Okay. And you could add other operations that are not superficially differentiable, like, for example, if analysis, but then if you do that, you will assume here that you have come up with some kind of a differentiable approximation of that, uh, that power. Okay, so now what sort of stuff can we do, do with this? Well, for one, let's uh, do some deep learning with this little programming language of ours. My first claim is that these classical recurrent neural networks, right, which are used to um, often import sequential data, this can be written as a simple program in our language, and it just looks like this. So you're taking an initial sentence or a sentence as input, and then you are starting with this uh, initial vector, which is the C0, and then you are just uh, doing a fold of that sentence and then that's what's giving you this encoding vector and that is the latent representation of this uh, sentence if you're using it well this is an encoder it encodes a sentence into a vector what about a decoder well that's just an unfold right so here you're starting with an initial vector c0 and then you are applying this function f repeatedly to construct this um, this uh, sentence. What about an encoder and decoder? Well, that is just a composition of these two things. You're starting with, uh, let's say, a question, which is up there. You're folding the question, and then it uh, folding over the question, and then you're getting a vector, and then you are applying an unfold, and then you are generating the answer. So already what we see is that if I just hypothesize a structure of this program, right, where I just didn't know f and g and, and c0, right, and if I have a whole bunch of training data, I could position the problem of um, learning a, a recurrent sequence to sequence model as uh, just uh, the problem of finding parameters in that little program of ours. But the great thing about our DSL is that this is just one program structure that is possible. We could do a lot more. We could have a search process where you can go and generate a lot of other kinds of architectures. We could imagine a process where you have some predefined modules and you're using those modules as, as a component of this. For example, let's say you're trying to transfer from one a learning task to another learning task, right? Maybe you could transfer some of these modules, some dash that are, are parts of them. And so uh, here's an example of that. So here, um, what you're trying to do is a very simple task. You're given a sequence of um, of uh, n digits, and uh, you're trying to count the number of files in this uh, in the sequence. And so I could write a function that looks like uh, what we have above, and that circle is the composition operator. It's just uh, it's really that way for. Uh, Simple. Uh, so what you're of course doing if you are writing a program for this you would you would uh, write a recognizer that's going to take uh, each of these digits and it's going to you know uh, determine whether or not uh, this is a five or not a five and there's going to be a probability vector that comes out of this and then you know here you have a sequence a list so you'd be applying uh, this uh, recognizer to every element which for us is going to be a map and then after you do the math, you, you want to now you know, count. So that's basically like adding up the uh, the values that are there in the in the, um, in the outputs of the math. Uh, but it's not exactly addition; it's a little bit more complex because it's operating on these uh, probability factors rather than just uh, discrete digits. Uh, but you could imagine uh, a neural network that does that, that does that addition, and then you can fold over this. Uh, uh, this mapped out list, and then you get the uh, result. And uh, the benefit of this is um, that you can do things compositionally. For example, you could imagine a setting, which is what we did in this uh, paper uh, with uh, 
John Sutton and the students. Uh, so here we uh, uh, considered a lifelong learning setting where the agent is seeing a sequence of tasks. And to imagine that you are starting with this, uh, this task of uh, being able to, or learning to recognize uh, five, the digit five, and then you have a model for that. And then you are um, you know, imagining a process where uh, you're given the two tasks that count the number of files. And so you're, you want to know, you know what program will work for this. So you have this library where that recognized file module is already there, and then you're doing some synthesis, and then you are coming up with uh, that uh, modular program. And then um, one thing is that I knew what that recognized file is because that's a model from a previous task, but this add neural network, I don't know that at this time. However, not to worry, because this function is differentiable end to end. And what I can do is that I can train that add neural network in the context of this end to end task, and I could figure out what that module is. And so once I figure out that module, I can take it out and I can stick it into this library, and then this process will continue. Right? So what we get out of this is this kind of compositional uh, learning framework, and this is only feasible because we don't have this kind of a you know, big blob of a neural network. Instead, we have this highly modular compositional program constructed using functional abstractions. And so um, you can look at the paper for some experimental results. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, give you an example of the kind of tasks that we looked at. So uh, CS1 is a task sequence for counting. So you're first recognizing the digit E1, then recognizing the digit E2, and then counting the digit E3, uh, E1, and then counting the digit E2. And similarly, there are other sequences as well. And so what we showed is that there is a you know, significant transfer uh, between these sorts of tasks. And uh, compared to end-to-end -to -end approaches, uh, you can basically learn with a lot uh, uh, less data as, as you go ahead in your learning sequence. And if there are any further questions about this, we can uh, uh, take that out at the end of the, this session. Uh, I'll uh, move on to the enumerative search algorithm. So this is the algorithm that was used in that paper. And again, this is uh, the simplest of uh, all strategies for synthesizing neural symbolic programs that, uh, that are in play now. Um, but it does use important PLIs. So the basic setup is that you are doing top-down program synthesis. So what does that mean? Let's be concrete. You're starting with an empty program. So that's a program at the root of this tree that you see to your right. So you have lambda x f star. F star is a whole, meaning you don't know what it is. And so now you hypothesize that there are a few different possibilities. Maybe you know that XR is a, the empty list. Maybe it's uh, the input variable X. Maybe it's a map. Maybe it's a fold. And if it's a map and a fold, you don't know what the internal lambda is for uh, that uh, application, uh, for that function. So then that's why you then go down the search tree. So if you have hypothesis that it's a map, then you know the next step, you're going to go and try to uh, you know, generate the the, the internal lambda for that map, and that can be a map itself, uh, uh, or it could be a neural network, it could be a lot of things. So, now the important thing is that um, in this tree that you're building, right, so there are the internal nodes which are partial program structures. Okay, they have some code, but, but they are holes, and then the sinks represent complete program structures. And then the sinks are, are things that you can um, actually train fully using gradient descent. And you have a loss value for that, and you also have a structural cost naturally. So you have this C of alpha for each of these things. Uh, that's what it was. And so, um, and the edges here, they model um, individual derivation sets uh, as a product here on my exam. So, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to find a path from the root of this uh, search tree. To at least cost the same. Right? That's the problem. So. Okay. So we have a problem, which is that as now we mentioned yesterday, the problem of too many programs. Even for a very simple DSL, the space of programs is going to blow up massively. And one of the ideas that uh, now you mentioned, um, and uh, this is uh, something that's proven to be very powerful in the setting of formal program synthesis is to use types. Now, uh, one of the challenges in this kind of machine learning setting is that you don't have very 
sophisticated form of test again. We don't have that version of that, at least not yet. But uh, you still can benefit from tags. Um, so here is a basic tag system for our little language. So you could have you know, a basic data type with sensors, and you have these dimensions in your know, mock okay, for each of these sensor type. Then you have a list of sensors and your functions uh, of uh, you know, arbitrary levels of nested. And so you would imagine doing uh, using this type system to do pooling in this case. So you are starting out with uh, the specification that uh, I'm trying to you know, find a program that matches this data, but you know already the type of the data in terms of this type system. So you know that it's a, a list of tensors that are, uh, uh, so the input is a list of tensors where the dimensions are in one and two, the output is a list of tensors where the dimensions is uh, uh, of dimension n three. And so if you are imagining that, um, you know, uh, it's going to be a map. So as you are making that hypothesis, you can immediately come up with a type, a target type of that G-star function, the whole that is there inside that map. And so you know now that it's a function from tensor to tensors, input dimension M1, N2, output dimension N3. And now you are um, imagining that, oh, maybe, you know, it's a library module that one. But for all of the library modules, you already have types annotated. So maybe you just decide that um, F1 is uh, okay, but F2 is not established, right? And that allows you to do pruning. And so this can be applied uh, really high up in the search tree. So potentially you can rule out massive parts of the search tree uh, using this strategy. And we saw examples of uh, how this is useful. So uh, we compared in this paper um, the uh, two scenarios, one where you use types and one where you did not use types. And we found that using types drastically cut down the number of programs we have to consider. However, I want to be very clear that this can only go so far because in this kind of machine learning setting, it's all about quantitative objectives. And uh, this type-based idea doesn't really engage with that aspect of the problem now. So we need something more on in addition to types. And what is an example of things that we can do here? Well, we'll hear from Isan. Right. This is on you. Hello. All right. Great. Uh, everyone, uh, I'm going to be talking about learning with neural heuristics. Um, so I'm going to sort of quickly repeat the story so far in the language of almost pure optimization. So the story so far is doing top down synthesis. And so we started with, with let's say, the root node, which is a completely empty program that don't have start. So start is the program. Uh, and then we sort of search over the, the first possible depth of ways of completing this program. Some of them are complete, such as an empty, a dead ending function. Some of them itself has partial programs in it after we sort of add an app in this case. And we recursively call this search process. Uh, complete programs uh, are the ones, uh, uh, are, sorry, excuse me, we have three complete programs in this diagram. I'm going to call them terminal nodes. They're also called basic nodes. Uh, they're, they're known as terminal nodes in a search graph. And for complete programs, what are these terminal nodes? You can actually evaluate the training loss because they're complete programs. You can actually execute them. And then if you can run them on the on the input output example, you measure the loss. And if your programs have continuously differentiable continuous output parameters, then you can train parameters uh, using gradient descent. So you can do that with complete programs. So if you just out as far as with complex search space, so the space of program architectures that we can navigate through is typically exponentially large. We can only evaluate the training loss on complete programs because those are the only programs that we can actually execute. And all things being equal for simple programs. These are the three that I'm going to walk you through in the next 10 minutes. So the first thing we're going to talk about is structural costs, which is a way of measuring program complexity. I'm going to keep it fairly high level here, but you know, the basic idea is that for every modification of the program, which is an arrow in the search graph, which we're incrementally adding one more piece of structure to the program, we're going to assume that each such modification has a unit of cost. Uh, in this in this case, uh, uh, in the with the bed of uh, scripted notation. So, for example, going from S star to map with X G star has some cost that we want, and every time we do this operation, we incur an additional cost that we want. We assume that the structural cost is additive, 
And so this, the structural cost of the program is simply the sum of the structural costs associated with the edges in the search plan. And so with that in mind, our goal is to then find a program P that minimizes the combination of the structural costs and of course the training loss. And that's what you see in the bottom of the equation. And you know, there are many ways to define structural costs using the sign cost of each set of modification, but according to your domain algorithm, we'll do this. And so uh, we've so far left the common search space unresolved. The value only the value of each node, so the state of terminal nodes in the search graph unresolved. But we have now uh, have a framework to talk about what it means to prefer simple programs. We define a structural cost. Okay, so the first option in this in this language of, of thinking about the optimization problem is doing the research as far as suggested. And so here, you know, you just take order of the search over all the possible, all, over all the other model branches, uh, for example, those that are type safe. And then once you once you reach, whenever you reach a terminal node in this new branch for search process, let's say, then you measure the full cost, the structural cost, and the training loss. And then you return the best program found so far once uh, once your search budget is exhausted. So this is a new research. You're actually going to work through this in about ten minutes. Uh, to uh, in the work welcome session. Okay, so uh, how do we deal with the counter search space? Well, we, we kind of just hope that it doesn't bite us too hard, and we just use uninformed search and hope for the best. We still can only evaluate the actual loss on a, on a complete program or, or terminal node in this search graph. And of course, we're still using structure. Okay, so I'm going to take a step back and take you back to second year computer science courses and talk about graph search algorithms. Um, in graph search, you have a graph and you have costs associated with nodes and edges. You're only putting costs associated, excuse me, yeah, costs associated with nodes and edges. And you have some root node and you have one or more terminal or sync nodes. And the goal is to find the shortest cost half from the root node to one of the sync nodes. So, how do we think about graph search in the, like, in the context of program architecture search? Well, well, for if every node in this graph is a program, either terminal or either incomplete or non-terminal or complete program or terminal, then the cost from a non-terminal to a non-terminal node is just the incremental structural cost to make that modification. The cost from uh, a non terminal to a terminal node, then it's the structural cost of that transition plus the, the training loss, because we can actually evaluate the training loss at the terminal nodes. And so, therefore, the mid cost program is simply the mid cost half in this graph depiction of the search space. Now that we've seen how we can detect or visualize or understand program architecture search through the language of graph search, we can you know, go back to our various algorithms that we've learned. In uh, in our science undergrad courses, uh, such as A star search. And the key idea of underlying A star search and other informed search algorithms is this idea of the cost of growth here. And so, what is the cost of growth? Well, first, um, just sort of a little bit of notation. Uh, this, is mainly, this is just a, a slight, slight variation of what we've seen before. Uh, P star is a partial program, which is a non terminal node. Uh, script C of P star. Are the set of all possible completions of P star. So all reachable terminal nodes from this non-terminal node. So our goal is to construct a heuristic D of P star that can approximate the best possible completion, the cost, excuse me, the cost of the best possible completion to a terminal node from this non-terminal node. That's what you see in this equation. So the cost of go. Is this you know the minimum cost program that is in a set of completions of this particular big program? Uh, the purple thing is incremental structural cost. So, what is the additional structural cost you could even incur going from P star to P? And of course, the red thing is the training loss of that terminal of that program. So, this is the cost to go. And we want to construct some heuristic that estimates this. Typically, we want this heuristic D or P star to be a lower bound, to be a strict lower bound of, of the cost to go. And in that case, it's known as what's called a miscible heuristic. It is a strict lower one. Okay, now that we're equipped with this idea of a heuristic to estimate the cost to go, we're now, we're now able to describe an informed search algorithm. I'm going to show you a star search, at least in its simplest form. 
So I'm going to use this heuristic to inform the search algorithm. And I'll, we'll discuss how to implement, actually implement D with D star uh, later. But just here's the key intuition. Suppose we're looking at um, this incomplete program, uh, lambda of x, map x, g star. This incomplete program, and we want to know is it worth, is it worth our trouble, is it worth our computational efforts to keep expanding this subtree? In just on the off chance that the optimal program is contained in the subtree with a terminal node within the subtree. And suppose we measure the structural cost plus this is the equation of the model. Then we measure the structural cost plus the cost to go at this point. And suppose it was larger than the structural cost plus the loss of one of our complete programs that we've seen so far, which is that we have any function here. Suppose it was larger. Then we know that we can prove this entire subtree because, because since it is a lower bound on the minimum cost of, cost of any complete program in this subtree, and if we have this inequality, then we know that no program is better than the identity model from a regard to C. And then we can just prove the entire subtree. Is there a question? So the question is about how do we actually compute this cost of OD? I'll get to that in a minute. So first, let's assume we have it. Now we're ready to describe a star search. It's actually, after we set all this up, it's actually super simple. We have a priority queue of our current leaf nodes in our, in our search in our search space as we navigate the search map. And they're sorted by the structural cost thus far, plus our, our estimate of the cost of go. We hmm. iteratively pop off top program in this priority queue, but we just going to be a partial program. We check if this program is a complete program. If it is a complete program, uh, we terminate. Um, if otherwise, we expand P star and then we add child notes to the priority. There's an extra complication here because if it's a new program, we want to do gradient descent. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll look at that actually in detail in session three tomorrow when we go when we go over a star search as a as progressive as it sells. But this is sort of the basic idea. And the guarantee, a uh, star search comes with a theorem of guarantee, which is that if this estimate of the cost to go is truly an admissible heuristic, which is a lower bound to the real cost to go. Then A star search will always return the optimal program. The higher that you estimate the cost of go is, the more aggressively you can prove. And so you can you know, get much uh, faster <coughs> computational savings. An uninformed uh, cost of go estimate, which is just always return zero, mm -hmm. this isn't a missile heuristic, but it induces back to uninformed search, such as the new research, because D gives you no guidance about how to navigate the search. So you, don't, you, you reduce back to the new research. So that's a star search. And now, the sort of the punchline how do we actually get this in this focus? Implementing P star naively seems to require knowing the future, knowing how the future search process will progress. Historically, for various domains such as navigation and robotics, you've handcrafted a uh, duty study using domain knowledge, for example, that happens. Today, we're going to, expect, we're going to show you neural relaxation, which can implement P star. And then we'll look at other um, ways of doing this in session. So the motivating assumption that motivates neural relaxations is the idea that any neural symbolic model, which is a constrained class of large neural networks, a distilled version, if you will, you know, any neural symbolic model, their input output behavior can be well approximated by a large neural model. This is something that people have been learning about all the time when we're doing neural function approximators. So we call this a neural relaxation. The set of large neural networks. Is a relaxation of a set of neural symbolic models we have synthesized. What does that mean? For every neural symbolic program P, there exists some large neural network such that its cost to go is less than uh, the neural, uh, neural symbolic program's cost to go because it obtained lower training loss on the lead nodes. Now, of course, there's some slack uh, due to approximation error because we're not doing like even large neural networks or our training algorithm is. Perfect. So there's no slack there, the last one, but this is sort of the demo. And so what does that mean in practice? That means we have, we, we're back to this scenario. We have this incomplete program in the middle of our search space. We want to know if it's worth it to, to sort of keep recursively exploring this part of the search space. We replace this whole G star with a large neural network. We run gradient descent. We use the training loss here 
as our missed soldiers. This is how we implement our missed soldiers. And so if this large neural network cannot fit this all, then no neural symbolic repetition of this all can fit this all. That's the basic idea. And so now we've completed our descent route. For the computer search space, we use a form search, such as A star. A star requires an estimate of uh, full cost to go at every internal or non terminal node. We, we, we estimate that using a neural relaxation, which, which we can show in the incident in and for the last And here's one of the results. Uh, you can check out the paper for details. Uh, the bottom left is the best, and in this case, uh, our algorithm called near neural relaxation, the initial relaxations, uh, actually obtains uh, orders of magnitude speed on the very neural search. Okay, so a few comments that I wrap up. Uh, near is, of course, not guaranteed to be always admissible because uh, the neural network is not, maybe not infinitely large, or we have new professionals in our training routine. And so there's a relaxation of the guarantee about that epsilon admissibility. You can, that's a fairly standard guarantee. We have the full analysis of that paper. You can choose different neural nets in different situations, for example, recurrent neural nets or lists, convolutional neural nets or images. Uh, so the main knowledge is still useful. And neural relaxation is a powerful concept. It can be used in other optimization procedures as well. There are many optimization procedures that do this relax and it's still relaxing still. And so just to summarize, we see two uh, algorithms today, and I'll hand it over to you.
Um, there's going to be a small price for the top conforming program. You can get us on the FOS or the test set. So the exact same data set that you've been using uh, earlier. And there will also be a raffle winner. Uh, please just send us the logs, um, which I'll have the link on the slide. So again, you can go to the instructions uh, in the same link as yesterday at pic.ly slash DRSM. Um, there's going to be 30 minutes after this to walk through the workbook. Raise your hand if you have questions. And since the code, as you can see, is a little more complex than yesterday, and the new version also takes a few minutes to run around three minutes, we really highly encourage you to work in groups so you can discuss the new version and develop the same mode, since the runs do take around three minutes. And finally, uh, if you want to submit your solutions for the challenge and grapple, go to uit.ly slash zero seven challenge and we'll be announcing the winners of the grapple and top one at this session tomorrow at noon. So make sure to get your submissions in before then. Um, so then you guys go ahead and engage your groups. Thanks. So we can take a couple of quick questions, and then if there are additional questions, uh, please just come up because we don't want to uh, distract you from the activity. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the question is about uh, the cost. The added competition cost of, of measuring the neural relaxation, which requires training a neural network. That's a great question. It, does, it is a non trivial amount of cost, and it's only worth it if it allows you to prune a large fraction of resources. So that's something that you have to evaluate case by case. But there are many cases, and we've seen in our experiments, where it is more than worth it. Was it the actual mapping that you're training this on? It is or not what you're working on right now. Okay. Um, I, okay. Uh, so my question is, um, when you're doing your program search, um, I'm curious how you guarantee that the cost between two different programs uh, that are equal to zero, because I can see uh, it being advantageous to do like one presentation of a program into an equivalent presentation, um, and you wouldn't want to prune branches that could take you uh, down that path, otherwise you could get stuck in the world. So if you if you have a proper initial literacy, you will never get stuck in the world. That's a it's a guarantee because you won't you won't prune anything that's you're not a, you're not a, a mistake because it's a because it's a lower on that model. We can talk about that and I think in the interest of uh, letting people work, if anyone has further questions, you can come up with an answer with that here. Otherwise, that's uh, what it's worth. And as Jennifer said, uh, please work with us a lot more fun. Now.